thank you for joining me today, dear Bunker. Uh, I've been looking forward to speaking with you uh, both about the experiences uh, of the amazing Barefoot College uh, over the past 49 years and the uh, deceptively simple philosophy that uh, underpins much of your work, because I think there's a lot that the next generation of uh, strategic philanthropists can learn uh, from this. Sanjit uh, Bunker uh, Roy is a legendary change maker and activist and a powerful inspiration to people of all backgrounds uh, who are striving to make a difference in their own communities. Uh, Bunker founded the Barefoot College in 1972, initially to provide rural Indian communities with basic services and solutions in order to support them on their journey to self-sufficiency. And over the past half century, based on the uh, timeless principles of Mahatma Gandhi, the model that uh, underpins the Barefoot College has proven to be highly uh, transferable. And today there are programs and initiatives in more than 70 countries around the world that are based on the barefoot approach, uh, all of which have been uh, carefully ta tailored to the communities to which they belong. Outside of his work with the Barefoot College, uh, Bunker has become uh, widely respected as a powerful advocate and an authority across a wide range of social and economic issues. And as a result has received uh, an array of accolades and awards for his uh, decades of uh, tireless work. Uh, Bunker Roy, uh, lovely to see you again, and uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, brother. Thank you for the introduction. I think it was um, much too much, but I will accept it quietly. <laughs> thank you, sir. You, you established the Barefoot College uh, more than four decades ago. I'm interested in the extent to which the overall mission of the initiative may have changed over time, or whether the fundamental principles behind it have remained the same throughout. And also, what do you know now that you wish you knew then that could have made a difference uh, in how you designed or implemented the Barefoot College's work? We haven't changed the philosophy and the principles of the Barefoot College for 50 years because it is so simple. It is so down to earth and everyone in the community understands that. It's a question of focusing on basic minimum needs like water, education, health, employment, livelihoods, which is required everywhere in the 600,000 villages of India. You can't even, you can't locate one village in India which can say that they have act, they're actually self-sufficient with these basic minimum needs. That is one thing that uh, we, um, we have promoted and we have kept to that mission from the very beginning. The second thing that we managed to communicate is that traditional knowledge, village skills, and practical wisdom is something that is available in everywhere in India. And what the Barefoot College has done is to bring it into mainstream, saying that this cannot be ignored. It is indigenous knowledge of the highest order because it has stood the test of time. And why is it not possible to replicate this approach everywhere in India as well as abroad? So we have not changed our mission or philosophy because what Mahatma Gandhi said still stands very dear to us, which is that you have to reach the last man and woman. You cannot only look at the fringes of what is happening in the communities in India. What about the lower castes? What about the untouchables? What about the people who have been marginalized. They're the ones the Barefoot College is focusing on, on a large scale. And we have managed to do that in, in about 13 states of India, in starting small projects which are grassroots. Our philosophy is also never to start a project which is based in a city or in a district. It has to be based in a village because you have to be closer to the people you have to work with the poor. You have to understand the way they think and they, what they want. And that is what the Barefoot College has managed to do. We are in 23 states of India today, and all of them have actually been located in the village, and that's where they start from. So the Barefoot College mission remains, and I think it will continue to remain because it's so simple and it's so easy to understand that this is, you don't need a high-powered study to say what you need in a village. You can see it right there. It's common sense that's required there. That's all. 
No, that, that's, that's beautiful. And as I said, perhaps deceptively simple, but highly impactful. Um, I, I want to just talk about the, the scaling that you uh, referred to. As you, of course, mentioned, you began in one rural village in India, and today there are barefoot programs and initiatives in many regions in India, but also different countries around the world. In your experience, what are the challenges that come with scaling up a philanthropic initiative of this nature uh, across different markets? And what kinds of things would you advise other philanthropists and social sector entrepreneurs to think about uh, before they begin to scale up their own initiatives? I think you have to start from the grassroots. You have to start from villages which are the remotest, whether they're the remote islands in the Pacific or the remote uh, villages in Africa. I think the barefoot solution is something which concentrates only one year at a time, one village at a time and one year at a time, because no one looks at five years. It has to be something which is doable, something which is within one year that you can achieve and get those dramatic results. And it's simple, drinking water. How do you get drinking water at community? How do you get basic services to the community? You don't need something, something very elaborate. You don't need something very uh, hierarchical. You need something which is face to face with the communities at large. And this is what they understand the most. How much faith do you have in the people, in the community together that they can do it because we, have, we are so reluctant and look so skeptical just because someone is illiterate, so just because someone who's never been to school and college, we look down on them. The Barefoot College has always treated them as equals. The moment you give that impression and communicate that, then the job is easy because they know that we have to do it together. They can't do it alone. No one from Delhi can come and solve their problem in the village. It has to be someone face to face, one to one. That is the solution today. And that is what the Barefoot College has promoted. That is what has happened today, not only in India, but we took this Gandhian model abroad. We said, why don't we, why don't we have, why don't we show that we have confidence in the capacity and competence to do it without anyone from outside doing it? This was a very powerful message that they understood. The first thing they said, was, but we are illiterate. We need someone from outside. We said, no, that's not possible. That's not what you need to do. The only thing is you have to have faith in yourself. How much faith have you got in yourself to be able to do this? So what if you don't know how to read and write? You can become a solar engineer. You can become a, you can become a communicator. You can become an architect. Anything is possible, provided you have the confidence to be able to say, I will do it. I don't need anyone from outside to tell me how to do it. And the Barefoot College has managed to communicate that message. Not in, and when we went to Africa, we've gone to 36 countries in Africa, not one has said they can't do it. You know, we have got nine, we have got women in six months have learned 21st century technology without learning how to read and write. And they've gone back and solar electrified their own village. There are now over 50,000 houses in Africa, which have been solar electrified, what the Indian prime minister called solar mamas. These solar mamas have actually proved that, and everyone is now aghast how they managed to do it in six months. They don't know how to lead and write. They said, we learned by doing, putting our hands. We don't need theory. If you tell me there are 68 parts in a solar, in a, in a, in a, in a solar, uh, what do you call it? A charge controller. I can put those 68 parts without learning theory and I can make it work. And that is what you need. So when I went to Peru and I said, would you like the solar mama who can put this solar lantern in half an hour together? Or do you want someone who's gone from Stanford who's looking after the whole electric program? Who do you need? He said, I need the solar mama because this, this guy from Stanford doesn't only, only knows the theory. He doesn't know the practice. And that is what has given them dignity, has given them confidence, has given them respect. And that I think is a part of the barefoot approach. How do we give dignity and self-respect to people who've been marginalized, who've never been given any, any just no responsibility, not been given any uh, uh, recognition. These are some things which 
the Barefoot College didn't expect, but these are the spin-offs that have come off from the work we've done in, the, in all over the world. That, that's beautiful. And so much of what you said there is uh, incredibly, um, I think, important, but also uh, inspirational to those who are thinking about how to better scale their uh, models uh, around the world and to find a model that, is all, that also transcends cultural differences. Um, and I think you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. The simpler you are and the simpler it is, uh, the less likely it is to <laughs> face resistance or perhaps misunderstandings as you move from one region of the world uh, to another. Um, as you know, the, we're having this conversation under the auspices of the uh, Center for Strategic Philanthropy at the University of Cambridge uh, Judge Business School, which is focused uh, exclusively on philanthropy within and from the world's uh, growth markets, uh, often referred to as uh, so-called emerging markets. As, are you yourself seeing the evidence that the nature and perhaps prevalence of philanthropy is changing in these regions of the world? And what do you think is driving this sort of change? I think the driving change is the pressure which is being applied by the communities on the ground. The communities on the ground see injustice. The communities on the ground they see exploitation. The communities on the ground see inequalities. The community doesn't have any time now to wait. So that pressure is being felt all over the world by philanthropists. Deliver. Deliver for us. You have said so many good things, but deliver and show us that you can deliver on the ground. I think that is the message that the philanthropists are gradually getting to hear. But I think the philanthropists have to start working directly with grassroots communities, not through intermediaries. How do you work with grassroots communities? Because the mindset has to change by the philanthropists and the mindset has to change of the communities. There has to be some meeting point where they can say, yes, we will work together. But there's such a gap between the philanthropists and the people on the ground that I think that gap has to be lessened. The, the gap is too large and it's getting larger because we are not actually getting to the villages and the communities that need this most. Somehow there is some gap in between, some communication or credibility gap in between that is not allowing this change to happen and not, not allowing some services to reach those very poor people. I think this is the biggest problem. Why aren't we getting some philanthropists to say, all right, we've done some due diligence with X organization, which has got a widespread and scaled up model, which is provable, which is found to be effective. Why don't we work through them directly? Why don't we choose an X organization that says they are working in 60 villages all over India? Why not give, invest in that organization and then, then they will spread the message? I think the philanthropist has to come to that situation where they say, all right, we have got to change the way we are working today. It's too slow, it's too cumbersome, there are too many levels, there are too many layers, there are too many people in between. Why can't you have a direct approach with the communities that you're working with? And your due diligence process can be very exhaustive. It doesn't matter. Have they, have they got a track record? Are they, are they doing the audit statements? Are they writing reports? All these things are very important. But once you're convinced that this organization, whoever it is, is something that you'd like to work with, just go directly to them. And I think that is the doable part. And that can be done so easily. When the trust is developed, no problem. But that trust has to be done directly. And I think your center has to facilitate that somehow or other. I think that would be a very major innovative step that you can take. Thank you, Bunker. And I just want to uh, continue on this a little bit more. Um, you, you've, you've spoken just now and also in the past very eloquently about the importance of finding homegrown solutions to local problems and listening closely to people on the ground. The Barefoot College uh, has worked on the ground in many different communities, obviously, around the world. What are some of the key things that you have learned from the amazingly strong and inspiring people that you've met over the years in these communities? And how have these lessons uh, perhaps helped shape your own mindset 
and way in which you develop solutions to the problems that you observe? We have found that the only sustainable solution is to decentralize and demystify. Decentralize your skills. Decentralize right down to the village level where it matters the most. And demystify technology so that they use technology for the improving the quality of life. That is one me message which we learned very clearly from uh, what we've been doing in all these villages all over the world. The second was that women are the agents of change. You have neglected women for 60 years. Everywhere, the villages where we went to, all of them have migrated into the cities. Who are left? Only the old women. So why not invest in old women? Why not give them the skills that they actually identify only with men? So when we talked about solar energy with illiterate women who are 40, 50 years old, Everyone was aghast. They said, what do you mean? They can't even, they can't even go out of the village and you want to take them all the way to, uh, to India. I said, yes, because they have the courage. They have the, uh, they have the, uh, the tenacity that they want to do this. Give them a chance. Don't prejudge them and say it's not possible because they're only supposed to be in, in the kitchen and looking after grandchildren. Take them out of their habitat and let's see how they perform. We took these women for the last, from the 2008 to now, there are over 3,000 solar mamas all over, and they have shown that not one has proved a failure. They've all gone back and solar electrified their own village. So that is one second lesson we learned. The third is that there is a, liter there is a difference between literacy and education. Literacy is where you learn how to read and write. Education is what you get from your family, from your environment, and from your community. I think that is very important. That is what we learned. When we went back to the women today in, in these uh, villages, they all said that now they've got stature, they've got respect. And now most of them, when before they came, the husband said, all right, you can go to India, but I'm going to divorce you and get another wife. When she came back like a tiger and solar electrified the whole village, the husband said, my God, please come back. This is something which I never thought of. I thought you'd be a failure. She came back. Now some of the women say, no, 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 I don't want you. I'm so, uh, quite happy without you. I'm very happy on, on my own. So these are spin-offs that we've seen in the villages today. And this is what we've learned on a large scale. How do we keep it simple? How do we demystify technology? How do we get the communities involved so that the management control and ownership is in the hands of the communities? not in someone in Delhi or someone in Zurich. It has to be in the hands of the community and only then it will be sustainable. Simple message, but so difficult to make the World Bank understand. So difficult to make the UNDP understand. This is something which is, this is Gandhian. Go to the grassroots and work yourself up. This is what we learned. But it's so difficult to convey this simple message to people who are development planners, to people who have the money, they cannot understand how this woman can be an investment for us to be able to change communities from below. Yeah, but as you said, you've done it and you've demonstrated how, and there's no more powerful way than actually doing it. Uh, and, and for that, really, um, uh, the, the world really has, has you to thank for demonstrating how that can be done simply but impactfully. Uh, and, and again, uh, in a way that also can scale. Um, I, I try and avoid uh, talking about COVID these days, but it is unfortunately something that we are all still uh, dealing with. Um, I'd like to think that one of the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic has been to remind people that they belong to a community uh, and that their safety and well-being is often dependent uh, on the uh, resilience and collaborative nature of their community. And this is, of course, not a new lesson for many of the people that you have uh, worked with, uh, whose survival really depends on community. What do you think, uh, Bunker, are some of the lasting impacts uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic and, 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 and its impact specifically on uh, the social sector? The lasting impact of COVID in India has been the massive reverse migration that has taken place from the cities to the villages. 
that has been enormous. And now most of them want to stay back in the village rather than go into the slums of Mumbai or Calcutta. That has been one lesson that we've seen very loud and clear. The second is the traditional knowledge and skills that were dying have now been revived. Now there are artisans who went, car carpenters, leather workers, women, all went to work in the slums in Mumbai in some factory. Now they've come back to the village and now they want to revive that craft, revive all the work that they used to do, their father used to do. Now they want to make sure that this is happening in the village itself. So I think the labor force that the industry had in India is now going to be a very short supply for them because now they want to stay in the village. Now they want to get into government relief programs. There's something called the Rural Employment Guarantee Program in India, which is now giving jobs to 800 million people in India, in the villages. Can you imagine them getting guaranteed work for 100 days in a year, guaranteed. And if they don't get 100 days of work, then the government has to compensate. This is a remarkable program. Now, more and more people are getting to, those, to that program and getting 100 uh, minimum wage of 100 days uh, in a year. So now I think most of them are thinking, why go back to the village? Why go back to the cities? Why not give, why not stay in the villages? Why, this is one thing that the COVID has done. They walked hundreds of miles back into the village, hundreds and hundreds of miles. Most of them have died on the way. They don't want to go back. They want to stay. And I think that has been a, added point for the communities, uh, for the villages, for, the, for, the, for them. Now, if they get work in the cities, why should they go into a slum in Calcutta? If they get work, if they're treated decently, they get clean water, they get a health system, they got a school for the kids, why should they go back? So I think this has been the great impact of COVID on some of the communities in India, especially the rural communities have found. So now we managed to get about 500 artisans, give them marketing outlets for the, for the handicraft, and we're trying to see that we give them the market outlet through internet because now the exhibitions are not possible anywhere because of social distancing and so on. So I think there's been a great move, invisible revolution taking place in India today of how the reverse migration has got millions of people back to the villages. The whole demography has changed. Now it used to be, what, 52, 48, 52 in the cities and 48% in, now the whole thing has changed. Now, most of them gone back to the villages. So in a way, COVID has been, sad to say, very wrong, but COVID has been good for some of these villages and they've gone back. So I see the plus points in this. I see many people coming to me saying, thank God, I'm not going back to Bombay again. Let me do some work in the villages. Good thing, good reverse that's taking place. Excellent. Well, as, you know, with something like COVID, we'll take all the silver lining that we can get, but that's right. really a, a very... Um, very insightful uh, what you've just said now. And I think like, I guess, many things with COVID, some of the longer term socioeconomic as well as social implications uh, are yet to be, you know, will be played out over the years to come. And some will be challenging, but, uh, you know, right. as, as you've just identified now, there could be some positive shifts that COVID has uh, really uh, um, accelerated, uh, perhaps. Uh, a, f a final uh, question on uh, technology. You talked about technology, uh, but also communication. Nine years ago, you gave a powerful TED talk that's now been viewed by well over half a million people. 50 years ago, it simply wouldn't have been possible for one individual to communicate easily, so easily with so many different people in so many different uh, places. How has the, is the ability to reach so many people with your message changed the nature of the work that you do and how can philanthropists and change makers harness the power of these types of technologies without becoming hopelessly distracted by them? Small correction, brother. I've actually gone to 4.4 million in 45 languages. Incredible, and incredible. More, and got more hits in 2015 than Bill Gates and President Clinton and Al Gore combined. Amazing. So I've done badly at all. I've done badly at all. Phenomenal. You know, the women together, the 3,000 women together in 96 countries have actually generated 1.4 gigawatts 
of power in these 96 villages, which is the power generated by one nuclear power station. So the answer is, how do you decentralize? How do you spread it? Mahatma Gandhi said the answer to India is not mass production, but production by the masses. This is the answer today in India. How do you manage, not centralize, it's decentralized development that is going to be the answer of India. This is what we have almost everywhere where we visited, we have found this message loud and clear, simple, austere, down to earth, something that brings message, something that brings the communities together. I think the philanthropists must start a sort of a dialogue between practitioners on the ground and people who are there. Just have a dialogue and chat and get this mindset going differently on both sides. Today, there's suspicion among, on the grassroots groups of philanthropists. And philanthropists, you know, I went for five years to Davos from 2002 to 2008. And the only thing they told me was, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. You're not, you're not a billionaire. I said, no, I'm not. I was invited by Klaus Schwab. He said, you, how much did you pay? I said, it doesn't matter. But the fact is that I actually was visited because Klaus felt that I think philanthropists, industry, should meet the grassroots petition and change their minds about us. We're not all waving flags on the road. We actually want to work with you guys. And how do we manage to do that? And I think by the time I left in 2008, there was a sea of difference between the people who were, who were working with us and said, look, I want to meet you guys. I want to talk to you guys. Let's do something together. But not one industrialist from India came to me. Can you imagine? Not one. All of them went to school and college for me, for God's sake. And not one of them said, let's do something together, Bunker. Why is that? What is wrong with, them, with us? Why are we so suspicious about we people? So we have to break barriers, brother. You have to, in your institute, you have to break barriers somehow or other and bring us together and do something which is worthwhile and doable on the ground. And you know, as you've said, research yes. Research is all very well. I, we, research and studies are all very well. We're wasting a lot of money on that. We know what the basic problems are. Let's get on with it. Absolutely. And, and as you've said, there's so much more opportunity for much better integration between what's happening, as you say, in the so-called corporate world and on the ground, really on, in the social sector. You know, and as more businesses are forced to rethink their purpose uh, and, and really more pressures from multiple stakeholder groups for businesses to, to really think what their reason for being is, um, there's so much that businesses can learn from social sector actors and really change makers as to what is actually happening on the ground and how, how they can actually properly align and authentically align their, their uh, uh, sort of business purpose with uh, the needs, uh, closely with the needs of society. And I think there are also you know, you perhaps- You asked me one question. You yes. asked me one question about what can the first and second world learn from the Barefoot College? Can we apply the model to the first and second world? I looked at that very carefully and I came to the conclusion that the first and second world is too hung up on degrees and paper qualifications. There's too much hierarchy. How, where do you get the innovation? You get the innovation through flexibility. You get the creativity through flexibility. You get all these solutions coming out because they have not been bound down by little um, baggages somewhere. So I think the, the third world has much to teach the first and second world. Compassion, generosity, simplicity, austerity. You know, Leuda, Leuda da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It's the ultimate sophistication. Da Vinci said that, and I believe, I believe him. So I think the first and second world cannot, uh, uh, cannot start a barefoot college because they have too many hang-ups. But there are so many countries in the third and fourth world that the barefoot college will, be, will have an impact. Yeah, so no, so some, I, some, yeah. People, some people call it the third world. I call it the real world. This is the, the majority of yes, people. The majority of people live in these in this world, and this world, in many in many ways, is uh, you know thir the thirty fastest growing countries in the world last year were all from the so-called emerging markets. So it's becoming something that uh, yeah 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 absolutely. 
Uh, Bunker, you are a force of nature and uh, I wish you countless more uh, amazingly impactful years to come. Thank you again for your time today and for everything that you do. I pray that we can have uh, another one of our in-person brainstorm sessions soon and I wish you good health well, and well-being always. Best wishes for the new year. Happy Thank you, new year. sir.